You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit hankgarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I am super excited because I have my friends Nikki and Sean on the show. Uh, Nikki Gerard and Sean French make up the writing duo that we call Nikki French. They have a phenomenal new book that is just completely off the charts uh, good. Ooh. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm huge fans, uh, Nikki and Sean. You guys know that. And We've done this for uh, for several years now, uh, catching up on new book releases, and I'm excited to have you back. The new book is called The Lying Room, and it's out available everywhere now. Uh, so, yeah, welcome back to the show. Thank you very much for having us. We're so pleased to be here. <laughs> yeah, it's great I, to be here. I'm I'm glad to have you guys back. So, The Lying Room this uh, this book is a bit of a departure in that uh, this book doesn't have Frida in it, and last year. When we talked, we we talked about how Frida had had been going through, you know, some a bit of a uh, of a <laughs> of a personal change. She was uh, and, uh, you know, when I think we even mentioned that the next book was not going to have Frida in it. But when I got this one in the mail, uh, I was super excited to dig into it. And while it, it still feels like a Nikki French book, it reads that way. Uh, this is something completely new uh, for me, anyway. Uh, mm -hmm. How did how did you guys come to to this new book? Well, but it, um, for a start, I should say we, that the Frida Klein series we always planned it was going to be an eight book series. Right, it was going to end at the eight book, so we, so we knew it was limited. Um, and but you know, we spent we basically spent ten years of our life with Frida, and that involved you know she felt like a bit of our family. You know, we were going around. Following her footsteps around London, or she was following her footsteps in whichever way you see it. And uh, <laughs> but we, we, in a way, one thing we were clear with, with before we wrote we create, before we wrote about Frida Klein, we tended to write about ordinary people. And right. Frida was a, it's more like she's the, I, almost the first, we think of her as like the first character we ever created who's clearly much more intelligent than we are. And you know, she's a kind of alpha female loner, you know really special and and we re, what we wanted to when we once we finished with frida we loved the idea of getting back to someone who's just like us who's just a bit chaotic a bit ordinary trying to deal with dealing with a mess of ordinary life someone who's really not very good at being a detective in fact <laughs> which which is um you know one thing i was thinking about uh is that i would imagine that when you've when you have a character like frida klein and you have these these big set pieces that are already established that when you go to begin a new story, I'll bet there's a certain shorthand that goes along with that. You could just kind of pick up the story in a certain place and you, you already have things uh, in, in place that you don't have to recreate each time. Uh, <laughs> it, is that scary when you when you leave the, the comfort and the confines of that to just create something completely new and free? Yes, Gary, and that's why it felt so special as well. We really did feel like we were beginning again in some ways, and and it was painful to say goodbye to Frida, but very exhilarating to kind of begin writing standalones again and to come up with a book that we loved writing. We loved getting out of our comfort zone. We loved being in this new world. And there was a kind of freshness and vigor that we felt in writing The Lying Room. What about you, Sean? Was there any trepidation uh, in, in, in picking up this new character, new story, new well, you're, supporting characters? You're absolutely right. There's a kind of, the, you know, writing, a, when you write a series, it ch you, ch you have a completely, you write in really, as you say, a really different way. because you, you have a group of characters and you just follow them, yeah, exactly. And there's a kind of comfort about you know showing you know you 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 know the readers become familiar with them, you become familiar with them, you can let them develop. And yeah, it was like a kind of suddenly 
leaping into cold water. I mean, I can. It almost might be easier to say what our, you know, the, what the, what our actual starting point for this, which was very different for for this new book. We started really with a single image, which was which was we had this idea that you know that for anyone who's read the book, you know, it, it begins with, a, with what feels like a very you know, a very ordinary urban breakfast. A middle-aged woman gets up and she makes you know she makes breakfast for her children and for her husband and has to deal with all the chaos of the day beginning. And they all, everyone leaves. And at that point, she goes and ch changes her clothes into something smarter and gets on her bike and cycles. She's li they live in the east of London, and she cycles right into the middle of London. And what you gradually realise is she's going to have an assignation with the man she's having an, an adulterous affair with. And she comes to this flat in Covent Garden, lets herself in, and she finds his, his body dead on the floor. And then what is so the, the, at the, the question that was the starting point for the book is what should she do? So she's about to call the police like a good citizen should. And then she thinks if she does that, she will turn her life, her carefully constructed full life upside down. She will damage her family, her daughter is particularly troubled, and she'll, she'll wreck everything that she's built up over the long years of marriage. And so she thinks either she calls the police or she doesn't call the police and she cleans up the crime scene to remove all evidence of her existence. And this being a Nicky French novel, I leave you <laughs> to guess which one she does. <laughs> I, 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 we almost thought, I think when we were talking about the idea and when we were writing the book, we almost had two different genres in mind. I mean, the first you know, is it is it is it is a kind of modern film noir. Because we, I don't know if people are familiar with the with the film noir form. It tends to start with the you have a central character who makes one bad decision, and then from that from that time on everything unravels. But we also, but we also, so in a way, um, Neve makes this one fateful decision, and that just spills right through the book. But you know, what follows from that? But we also kind of thought of it as like a farce. But like a, an, a sort of a very dark, farcical drama in which just things. Once she's done that, she then is forced into creating more and more lies, and things just and, and every to, you know more and more chaos develop, and she has to make decision after decision. And at the same time, you know, we really wanted to have this woman in her middle age juggling everything. So, so we see her through the book trying to save herself, save her marriage, save her children, save lives by the end, um, be a detective. And at the same time, she has to make the school lunches. She has to feed the guinea pigs. <laughs> Friends crowd into her life and won't leave. So she's both juggling the life, her busy urban life, and she's juggling this, this detective novel. Well, a very dark farce is a, <laughs> is a perfect way to describe this book because um, it, it's so weird. Um, I, I love that you said that, that you guys really looked forward to kind of digging into an ordinary person's life, someone that's not a, a superhero in, in, in certain ways that, uh, uh, you know, that Frida Klein is uh, in the best ways, you know, she's a superhero. Um, but this is an, an ordinary person who is confronted with the, with the mundane nature of her life. And and, you know, it's, it's the, the old, you know, cliche, the grass is always greener on the other side. And, uh, you know, <laughs> if I could only have a little bit of excitement in my life, maybe I could then get through this monotony of, of, of the day to day. And and of course, we, we see that this, you know, this thing that she decides to do turns horribly wrong. <laughs> and and, I you know, while I would hope most of us have never gone to the lengths that she did as far as having an affair. I think we have all made poor decisions uh, and, and maybe kind of out of our normal, you know, mind that, you know, we, we make a poor decision thinking this is just going to be this thing. I need this for my mental health or my personal happiness, yeah. Yeah. not, not really thinking through all of the implications of what could happen. And and then we not, we yeah. yeah and we make that initial mistake and then watch things just kind of unravel and we can't get out ahead of the ball again. Yeah, and I mean uh, Neve is Neve is terribly punished for this right. this affair that she has, but she embarks on knowing 
that it's risky and knowing she might regret. So actually, as we start, as we were writing the book, we were thinking, here we are, these two people who've been married for nearly 30 years now. And one of the subjects of the book is, what is it like to be married for a long time? So we wanted to, we, you know, Neve is a woman who's, she's been a really good, loyal, loving wife. She's been a really good mother. And there's been so many bumps along the way. She's been a really good employee. And she's been the one who's kind of had to earn their living for them. She's been a really good, patient, loving, devoted, fiercely committed mother. And this is her bid for freedom, a little bit of being carefree, a little bit of thinking, pretending that she's young again, pretending that life is all before her, pretending that she can be carefree, that she doesn't have responsibilities. Um, and then, yeah, terrible things happen from that. <laughs> but one, well, one of the things, in, in, as, you know, uh, we don't give too much away, but in a way, Neve is forced in the, uh, in this, the story forces her to both, both be a criminal and a detective. Yes, right. she's almost investigating her own her own crime, and she's both. I mean, because she's an ordinary, she's not good at either of them. I mean, being a <laughs> being a, a being a, c- c- committing crimes, you need to, you need to be quite clever to get away with it. You know, one of the points about lying. I mean, there are moral reasons why you shouldn't tell lies, but also if you tell lies, it's quite complicated because one, you know, then you, then you have to tell other lies to fit in with your previous lies, and then more lies. You have to keep remember how all this this whole fictional lying universe you've created fits fits together, and basically Neve gets more and more entangled as the book as the book uh, goes on, trying to hold this tottering engine of lies together. One thing that I really love about the way the story unfolds is that um, we go from this initial situation, and and we have compassion on Neve. I mean, I, I think we can all uh, connect with her on on at least one level, if not many levels, uh, we've all, you know, gotten stuck in the ruts of life and there, there's some compassion that comes with some empathy that we feel for her. Um, but then, you know, when she, when she crosses that line, um, you know, we, you could lose the audience, uh, by her (laughs) making this mistake and then, you know, kind of turning, you know, if you can, you can become an unlikable character depending on your actions, but then she morphs into, as she's, kind of trying to unravel this thing that's happened to her, um, it really becomes a noble pursuit, um, you know, and, and, and she's only involved in this noble pursuit because of the lie and because of the infidelity. And it's really a complex uh, character study that we get to see that, you know, people are, are not um, just the sum of their mistakes. Uh, good things can still come out of that. Um, you know, out of our mistakes, noble things can still happen. Uh, but then you get to play with the complexities of, you know, we're only involved in the noble thing because we did this bad thing. It's it's really uh, kind of mind blowing. I caught myself <laughs> in, in several occasions just kind of sitting there with the book in my lap and scratching my head and going, I don't know what to think about this, but I like it. <laughs> it's, it's so good to hear you say that. Because we, we wanted me to not be, you know, we want to have someone who, yes, exactly. You, she, you, you, she's not at all always easy to like, but. You can just, you, you know, we, we certainly, we were desperate for, <laughs> for I mean, this, you know, of course, one of the problems about being, you know, there was it that uh, Hitchcock said somewhere about the secret to a thriller is to make a beautiful woman suffer. You know, and, there isn't, <laughs> and there is a way, of, which of course, when as writers, you create char- a character, you kind of love, but you've got to pun, you've got to put them through it. You've got to test them in every way you possibly can. But, yeah. And also when we were thinking, when we thought about the line, we thought, Obviously, we kind of started with Neve and everything that happened because of her decision and happens around her. But also then we created this cast of characters. I mean, she's got this close circle of friends who in the novel kind of invade her house and just won't go away. Um, And we took each one of them and kind of thought, what drama are they going through? And so what she just, you know, so Neve has her secret. She has her secret that nobody, not even her very closest friend, knows about and then bit by bit she discovers that they also have their secrets that nobody knows about so you have this sense of this very close-knit group of friends and this very close family and at the same time they're all leading these kind of secret separate lives and kind of hiding away in the shadows at the same time and one of the things that Nikki and I've always felt is that nobody's normal 
you know, if, if, if you think, look around at some, some person, you know, you think everything's simple and straightforward for them. It just means you don't know them well enough. You know, because every, all of us, we all have our secrets, don't we? We all have our hidden selves. So let, let's talk about the, the craft of this book uh, just a little bit, because we, we talked earlier about how when you're working with, with Frida Klein, there, that comes with a certain shorthand, and there are a lot of assumptions that you can make in the beginning of a story, because we all know it's going to have Frida, and we all know that this, this is going to happen, and this is going to happen, and, and we can uh, make a lot of, uh, there are things you don't have to talk about because they're just already understood. Um, when you're, when you're tackling a completely new character that's not connected in any way, what are some of the first decisions that you have to make in planning out a book like this? Well, well when we just talked about this, you know, we, we started, as, as we said, with this image, this woman facing this, this, this terrible choice and making, the, making a bad decision. What, what we always talk about then is, who does this, who does this have to be? Who's this sto- who, needs, who needs to be? Does it, who does this story call for? And and so we just talk and talk, and you came, and it came to a, you know it shouldn't this wasn't this wasn't the story of a twenty year old, and it wasn't the story of a sixty. This is someone, a woman in middle age who's you know who's got a you know, she's just accumulated friends and children and things. So it's felt like that. And then also, also always crucial to to it is where where does this story have to take place? And it's clearly this wasn't a story was going to happen in a village. This was in, a, in a, this was in London. This was a real London story. In fact, to be, to be, we can own up to this. But, uh, we, we tend to we're like we're quite vampiric about the way we draw on our own lives. So <laughs> the, 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 the the apartment where she finds the dead body is exactly an apartment in Covent Garden that we used to live in. Absolutely to, to the you know to every bit of it. And Neve lives in East London, where all four of our children now live and in fact the name of the road on which he lives is a mashup of the names of the roads they live on so we kind of we absolutely kind of drew on our own family life like that the other thing that we thought about with this book in particular was the kind of time scale of it so there are i think there are eight long chapters each of one which ends on a cliffhanger and we it's so it's squeezed into this there's just several days the action takes place in a very kind of intense few days and it's like a kind of helter skelter action so we wanted to have it like a sense of there's no kind of sense where you can just take a deep breath and think okay there's a bit of kind of tranquility now it's like helter skelter that we wanted to go through this novel yeah again exactly as picky does it repeat what you want to said this because this was a bit that was also the you know this wasn't a story that could take place over six months it had to be just you know you could have that neve can hardly hold her breath for this week you know and then we thought, so a lot of it, you know, it's called The Lying, which is obviously a kind of lying and lying, and it's about different kinds of lying. Um, and we wanted it to be well, very different from the kind of Frida books. We wanted it to be very domestic. So most of the book takes place in kitchens and bedrooms and back gardens, and there's a bathroom or two thrown in as well. And it's, it's in, in this very, very kind of domestic, urban setting. And every, you know, people are just crowded in to this particular house that Neve lives in. And so it's just taking place in this kind of squashed crowd of people who are trying to hide from each other. And yet are just there they are pressed up against each other. Which is a great metaphor for the the almost stifling feeling that Neve is feeling on the inside of uh, all this this pressure coming in that the, the way you illustrate that. With the physical people around her and her surroundings is is really great. Well, that's right. Because like, in a way, one of the points about you know this is like a group of friends, and in a way, people you know people love their friends, but they, people can be stifled by their friends as well, especially, yeah. especially if they have to cook for them. And, and, that happens <laughs> this way. and then we had a, we had a few kind of little images going through the book. So one of them is all through the book, Neve is trying to get to her allotment, and her allotment is kind of where she can kind of dig, till the soil and feel a bit free, free from all the kind of pressures of her life. And so, you know, every day she's wanting to get to the allotment, but, but is really failing to get there. The, uh, uh, Nikki, you mentioned the structure of the book, and um, this is not something that, that you see very often, um, a book that is, that is like eight chapters long. Uh, the, the chapters 
are really kind of feel like uh, a collection of novellas, maybe short novellas or long short stories. Um, what was the, can, can you dig a little deeper into why you guys decided to structure the book in that way uh, in a time where a lot of thrillers you know, have, have short chapters and kind of keep, uh, you know, to keep you turning pages. What, what was the yeah, thought so process we, about going against the grain in that way? Yeah, so we, we often have short chapters in the books that we write, and they're very right. useful. They're a very useful way of kind of keeping people going. But in this case, so each chapter is basically another day in the terrible life of me at this particular moment. So we just wanted it. It was like a, a space of time that we're going through. And also, so one of the things that we try and keep aware of when we're planning a book is is the kind of um where the kind of drama points of the book are so there needs to be kind of peaks and troughs in books it can't just be kind of flat and it, but it can't be so kind of the same pitch all the time so we it was almost like a wave kind of rising and falling or coming to a crest at the end of each chapter so we wanted to have kind of these eight waves kind of getting higher and higher and gathering up more and more kind of grit debris and flops and jetsam and then crashing down at the end of each chapter there's this famous thing isn't it that uh, Chandler said this you know uh, when in doubt have a man come through the door with a gun and in a way in a sense we had, we got to a point at the end of every chapter and metaphorically a man comes through the door with a gun love it Jackson's battle to take control over his own mind and life portrays what millions of people are fighting with around the world mental illness his mother, desperate to free him from his demons and desperation, faces her own turmoil and anguish, doing anything possible to save her son through love and hope. After countless emotional and heartbreaking triumphant moments, June and her son must both accept that only Jackson can save himself. Pick up Jackson by Lynn McLaughlin and discover why people are raving about this book and saying things like, Jackson is symbolic of millions living with some form of mental illness, and his mother represents the millions who have their own struggles caring for someone with a mental health issue. Jackson by Lynn McLaughlin. Pick it up today at Amazon.com. Both Barrels Publishing is the brainchild of successful indie author James P. Sumner. He has self-published over 15 titles in the last five years, and has over 800,000 downloads so far in his career, meaning he has a wealth of knowledge and experience to share with the indie publishing community. Knowing the struggles of the modern-day indie author as well as he does, he wanted to create a platform that would allow writers of any level to learn the ropes, navigate the pitfalls, and produce a professional novel without wasting time or money in the process. Both Barrels Publishing is the perfect one-stop shop for any indie author, Combining James's expertise with his own team of editors and designers so you can help your novel realize its full potential and learn how to publish yourself. The purpose of Both Barrels Publishing is to help indie authors get their novels ready for publication without all the stress, hassle, and unnecessary expense. We want to make your lives easier, which is why we're giving you access to a top-notch team to publish your novels along with a generous discount on their services. You can also work one-on-one -on -one with James to learn the intricacies of self-publishing. No hidden cost, no false promises. We simply want you to publish the best version of your novel. BothBarrelsPublishing.com Love it. Um, th what, uh, what number book is this for you? I, I know that you've been uh, <laughs> writing Frida for like 10 years now. Uh, and and there were other standalones before that. How many does this make for you? So this make this is our twenty first book. Okay, so Excellent. we did twelve standalones, eight Frida novels. Just make sure my math is right, and then this is the first standalone <laughs> after Frida novels. Oh man, um, how how have you guys coalesced as a as a creative team uh, over these twenty one books and? Did you learn anything new about yourselves, about each other, about the process in, oh, right. <laughs> in going back to writing a standalone? Well, we've, you know, I mean, the one thing for a start is now, you know, so we, when we, we started writing our first book together on the very first day of 1995, when we'd been married for about four years. So, so really, the majority of our marriage, we've, by far, we've been writing together. 
And it's just, I think it's now become inseparable from the way we see, you know, from our lives, because we just, it's just natural. Now we just talk about it all the time. Almost everything we experience, there's a bit of this, there's, you know, could, could this make a story or could we use this? So, so there's an absolute, so there's, and we, I mean, in a way that one of the things that's been so fat, let me speak for myself, and Nikki can now disagree, <laughs> is it's been a way of weirdly learning about each other. I suppose if you think this story is about, about a couple in dining room, you know, it's about a couple who just really, they suddenly start to learn things about each other. And I think that I've, you know, that at seeing, c- collaborating in this very intimate way, going into very dark areas, you know, really tackling things that scare us or worry us or obsess us, seeing Nikki do that, I think it's been a very, I think I've just, she, she, she wasn't, I didn't quite realise when I married Nikki quite what was going on in her imagination. I mean, I think that there's something, I mean, intimacy is the right word. There is something strangely intimate and vulnerable about that act of kind of writing to each other and sharing each other's imaginative processes and thoughts. And it's almost like kind of seeing inside the strangeness of a mind. And I, you know, so there's a way in which it's not that I discover secret facts about Sean it's more that <laughs> it's like something like kind of being down there in the workings of his mind and I tell you the, I think that and this is kind of a wonderful thing I think that Sean is very odd so you know there's a kind of real strangeness about Sean but then there's a strangeness about everybody that you know what in a way what we write about as Sean was saying earlier is how nobody is normal everybody right. is strange underneath the kind of civilized surface that we mostly present to the world People are kind of odd and full of kind of conflicts and desires and angers and insecurities that they don't normally show. But when you write together, you're just pressed close up against all of those things. The the writing process can be uh, well, it, it is one of the weirdest um, uh, situations a person could be in. It's uh, it, it's laying your soul bare. It's it's uh you know, letting the world into your weirdness Uh, and, and, you know, our, all of our hopes are that we, that we finish this thing and the whole world reads it. Yet while we're in the middle of the doing of it, um, we're, we're very weird about it. We, we don't want people to see what we're doing. Um, and, and, you know, at at some point as the thing finishes, then we're ready to share it with the world. Uh, but the writing process can be it, it, we talk about it being lonely and 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 I think a lot of that is kind of self made because we don't want to share that process but it's too personal it's too raw um how does that, that is work so right that is so I absolutely think that's right, and that's why it's such a perilous endeavor for right. people to embark on when they're doing it together because it is very very exposing and you can feel very ridiculous and kind of humiliated. <laughs> You know, I think there's something about writing which is very close to being a bit mad. Um, And so you're kind of going a bit mad together and you're showing each other all the most kind of vulnerable, pulpy. You said raw. That's exactly right. The kind of raw, unprocessed, undefended bits of yourself. And yet we're doing it together. So, we, so, you know, the only thing I can say about that is that we have really tried to respect each other and protect each other during that process so that you know so that we have a few rules that we've kind of realized that we've got kind of over the years and those rules are about trusting each other and protecting that trust i know a few other people have tried to write together and 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 have not succeeded partly because i think if there's any kind of of, you know it turned out there was a kind of in, in inequality of there was a power struggle and what you know, one person was dominant, and I think that what the real thing, but you know, apart from everything else, is that is I've always trusted that if Nikki change, you know, rewrites something of mine and changes it, it's not because she's trying to take control of the book. At least I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is just a feeling of what does this book? You know, she has. You know, we both have a sense of what this book needs. You know, that's what that's always what it's what it's about. You you mentioned um, that the, the the writing process, the creative process, is really so ingrained in your relationship, and that this has taken um, up the majority of your marriage. Uh, how do you 
are, are there things that you do to um, to get away from it? Um, I work at home uh, and my wife works with me and we we love the house that we live in. We love where we are, but sometimes we have to get away to get away. We have oh. to go somewhere else to, you know, let our let our minds you know, go somewhere else and, and not right. talk about work all the time and, and podcasting and writing and, <laughs> and all of that stuff. What do you guys do so to I, keep it fresh and to get yeah, your life back? Uh, yeah. Everybody needs to leave their kind of normal life sometimes. I mean, one thing I would say is that you, you can leave your normal life, but kind of the writing self follows you. So you can, there's not right. a way in which you're kind of closed, closed for ideas at any point, I don't think. But we absolutely kind of both separately and together are often escaping the kind of that life, that writing life that we love. So for instance, we go, we, have just come back from a walking holiday in France. So every year we go away and we walk for kind of a week or 10 days. And what we do when we walk is we talk, we kind of work out what the next book is. But it's a very wonderful way of kind of having the kind of wind, wind of change blow through us, if you like. And then we just, you know, we, we go to Sweden a lot, which is where Sean's, uh, half of Sean's family comes from. We kind of see friends we go to the theater we run i swim a lot we go biking we get you know we we do we do lots of things to make sure that it's not we're not just kind of wrapped up in the life that we've made but that the kind of there's lot there's there's input if you like but you never really escape it because what one thing we have had is that you know the, the the really interesting ideas come when you're not expecting them when you're doing something completely different which is one one reason, of course, why it's great to get out of the office and get out of your routine, because then that somehow stimulates the brain to, to react in, to, in different ways. But on the other hand, at a certain point, you have to put all that aside. You do have to come back to your come back to your <laughs> office and put your put sit down and you know actually put it onto paper. Because one of the terrible that we were talking about the anxieties of writing, and one of the I think one of the big anxieties is you have this perfect book in your head. And at a certain point, you need to start actually putting this much more imperfect book you know, onto pay, on, onto your screen. And you know, you know, I mean, one way of avoiding being judged cruel, cruelly is, never, is to not write your book. You know, that's a good way of avoiding right. criticism. Well, that is uh, is a fantastic uh, thing to look at. Um, over twenty one books. <laughs> does, does that uh, does that fear of judgment ever leave? To, you know, do you ever think? I'm a professional now. I, I'm going to sit down. We're going to do this book together. We know what we're doing. We've done this 21 dadgum times. I think we can do it again. Or do you ever, like everyone else, sit there staring at the screen going, I have no idea what I'm doing today? Like everyone else. I mean, <laughs> I think that if writing became suddenly easy or like some kind of formula, then that's the time to stop it, really. But I, th I think the kind of wonderful terror of writing is you begin from zero and you're still this kind of naked self and I mean I actually think that in the act of writing I or speaking for myself I don't feel anxious about what people will make of it while I'm writing it's kind of once you're done and looking at it as a kind of thing that you've made that you feel scared but that you know we both have terrible days and I don't, I've, not, I've met very few writers who don't have terrible days when you turn up at the desk and it's just awful and nothing happens and everything is against the grain and you feel kind of empty of everything. And then, and then, but the trouble is you have to go through those days in order to earn the days that are as good as any day can be when everything is going right. Also, I'd say if you, uh, you know, if you, I think if, if there are any writer, I think it's I think maybe different with the writers of, of non-fiction. If you're writing biography, you can. That's a kind of craft, and you can be confident about that. But I think anyone writing fiction should feel a certain humility and fear at the beginning of every book, because you, you know, your reputation, what you've done before, doesn't count for anything. You're always starting, at, you know, as if you've never written anything before. I mean, you should, you should, you should be aware of that without letting it paralyze you. I, I think that is crucial. Uh, if if we think of of, uh, of novel writing, storytelling, that, that, you know, side of creativity as a gift. Um, I, I think you have to approach that with, with humility that, um, you, know, uh, you know, no matter 
what you think about how the, the human brain works and where these things come from. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think we've all we've all been there on days when it's really there and we've all been there on days where it didn't show up. And we really appreciate the days where it shows up. Yeah, it's so true. <laughs> and I think there's this weird, there's a kind of weird tightrope one walks as a writer. So on the one hand, you have to be full of faith because otherwise, why are you writing this book? Right. And on the right. other hand, full of doubt. And you have to kind of hold both those two things in a kind mm. of kind of precarious combination. Yeah, I'd also say, and I think this applies to almost every, there are plenty of other jobs as well. One of the greatest pleasures of life is a, is, is a kind of flow. But sometimes you, you don't get it every day, you may not get it every week, but at certain points where it just, you, it almost, the book seems to be writing itself through you and the characters are, you know, it's all happening. And that, you know, that, that, and that's a great pleasure. I think some, you know, people can have it while, you know, and fixing an engine or something where they suddenly understand how it's all working and it's all coming together. And I think that, that you know, but you need to, you, you know, you, you need to turn up every day if you're going to get that occasionally. Starting in 1995, when you guys started writing together uh, and up till today, the the tools that we use, the technology that writers use uh, has changed quite a lot in some areas and not so much in other areas. Uh, what kind of what kind of tools uh, are you guys using now or, or things that you've discovered that helps? Uh, your collaboration process or, or just, uh, you know, writing in general? Uh, or are there things that you guys have discovered that, that help you do what you do? Mm, well, I don't think it's changed so much for us because basically, I mean, I didn't think that we could have written together before email. And, and definitely if we hadn't been able to use a computer and were writing longhand, we couldn't have written together. So we are very simple in our kind of technological needs. You know, we need email, we need computers. Yeah, I mean, in a way, I'd say the problem is that if the, I think I'd put the, the question rather differently, is I think if, if someone goes back and reads our early book, what, you know, some uh, young young readers, what they'll be struck by is the lack of mobile phones and Google and, uh, <laughs> in the, in the, I mean, in the plot. And right. uh, in a way, I think one of the, I think it's been a, you know, in, in certain respects, it's helped the ability to do research as writers and you know you, you can google things that you'd have to go to a library to check out or go and talk to an expert but the, you, know, you can do an exercise go back at some of your you know your favorite old thrillers and almost all of them would be ruined by you know having a mobile phone to call or being able to check someone on google you know there are so many i think there's one one, one prediction i think they're going to be quite a lot of thrillers now set in the past just so you, you don't have you know you know the all the problems that, that modern technology, you know, brings. They, don't, they make life easier, but they don't make it easier for creating thrillers. Right. Uh, well, I remember when the, the Jason Bourne movies uh, came out. Uh, it's been over a decade ago now, I guess, um, with uh, with Matt Damon. Mm-hmm. Uh, I went back and picked up those books and started reading. And they were written in the 70s and, of course, set in the 70s. And, you know, Jason... Uh, being in the thick of something and having to find a payphone, um, yeah. you know, to <laughs> exactly, was, exactly, yeah, those yeah. Are the days. Also, so and, and, the and while it was shocking, yeah. uh, it, it really, but, it really added something yeah. to the exactly. to the story, like but Sean think, was saying. Think of all the things in old thrillers where people someone wants to disappear, so they just go and they'll go and go to a hotel and pay in cash, or go and buy an airline ticket with cash. Try and do that nowadays. Exactly, but, you know, and you'll immediately they'll call the police. It's very, you know, think the. the it's much, much harder for a character to disappear, you know, because there are so many, you know, you can get there. Just... And there's the curse of CCTV as well. <laughs> oh, right, right. And of course, you know, and of course so often in, in, you can see it more often in films, they'll have, they endlessly have to say, look at their mobile phone and say, damn, there's no signal. Or, <laughs> or I'm just out of battery, because otherwise, you know, you can always just call for help. Right. Oh, man. I, I think that's a great... Uh... That, that's a great opportunity for writers set, go back in time and set thrillers. Uh, you know, it's, it's one reason why we still love Agatha Christie, you know, a hundred years on um, her that's stories funny. require us to think and, and not just lean on technology. That's, that's a great point. And, and it's, you know, it's one of the improbable things how, you, you know, if you, if people had been told at the time of Conan Doyle and Agatha Christie, the people would be still reading them a hundred years later, when lots of other people who are considered much more 
you know, much more highly regarded at the time, had been entirely forgotten, they'd be absolutely baffled for this. Uh, they, they, you know, they've survived in the, you know, the authentic way, which is people just still want to read them. Well, I think they were probably considered uh, kind of pulpish uh, in their time. Yeah, sure. uh, yeah, schlock. That's a, that's a great word. And um, you know, some people may look on modern thrillers in the same way that you know, um, but I, I think the thriller itself, as well as a lot of other uh, fiction, but the thriller genre really allows us to see, to take a peek into human nature and to play around with. You know, what would we do in a situation like this and allow us, the readers, to um, to test our own morals in a lot of ways? And, you know, what it allows us to see the consequences of things. And uh, I think that's one thing that you guys have really done well in the lying room is you allow us to go with Neve and to play these what if games that I think all of us have have uh, entertained in our mind at one time or another. You know, what if I could just get away from my normal life for one day. And, and, and I think it, it beautifully illustrates that. Well, that's very kind of you. It's so weird. I mean, I think one moral to align with is call the police. <laughs> <laughs> Well, The Lying Room is available everywhere now in hardcover and uh, Kindle edition and audiobook. Uh, guys, I've been listening to the audiobook the last few days, and it is phenomenal. There's, uh, I, I love, uh, I, I love that, that audiobooks are, are really having an upsurge right now, and that's, that's one of my favorite ways to consume books now, especially thrillers. There, there's yeah, something, there, there's something, something visceral about having a thriller read to you. I think that's just so true. We become absolutely passionate audiobook listeners. You know, yeah. I think it's it is. It's good. It's been an explosion, and I think they're they're, they're great. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so, what are you guys working on now? Well, we 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 uh, we finished the book after this, and we we uh, we, we won't give all, all we'll say about it. Is we can say the germ of this idea, the, the idea of this new book, uh, is um, it's about a woman who's having to solve a murder. From inside a prison, where she's being held <laughs> on charge with murder. Oh. And she has the oh, I cannot wait to read that book. Well, um, you'll have to. <laughs> okay, I, I will. I promise, I will. Yeah, um, it'll, be, it'll be about this time next year. Yeah. Great. Well, uh, do we have a standing date? Uh, we do. To, okay, It'd excellent. To we will. Again, we yeah. will do that for sure. The Lying Room out everywhere now there's links to it in the show notes uh nikki and sean where can people find you online if they want to dig into this massive back catalog that you have and follow along for news well the easiest thing is to you can just watch, if you look search for it on twitter and then you can find out about this and there's also you can look for us on facebook excellent we'll put links to all of those uh, as well as uh, a place where they can buy the book uh, nikki and sean thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to to talk with me again about books it is such a pleasure thank you I really enjoyed it a hitman with a conscience Ian Bragg is paid to kill people only bad people and not many but for a great deal of money case the target make the hit move on until he meets the woman with sparkling green eyes who changes everything a few pre-readers had this to say about Ian Bragg Mark Dawson, million-selling thriller author, says a rip-roaring ride from start to breathless finish. Craig Martell hit a home run with the operator. The taut, lean prose and lightning-fast pace make this a page-turner without sacrificing an ounce of story or depth. You'll find yourself rooting for the hitman main character as he faces the toughest decision of his career. The operator is the start of a new thriller series I expect to see burning up bestseller list for years to come, says A.C. Fuller, author of The Crime Beat and Alex Vane Media Thrillers. Suave, romantic, and lethal, Ian Bragg is everything you want in a highly paid assassin. Can't wait to ride this train, says James Blatch, self-publishing formula. It's been a long time since I fell this hard in love with a book, a very long time. Author of Women of Wine County Romantic Suspense, Terry Wells Brown says... Grab this book from Craig Martell, The Operator. Bone Thief. 
John Driscoll Book 1 by Thomas O'Callaghan. A sociopathic killer is using the internet to lure seemingly random women to their gruesome deaths in New York City. During his heinous murder spree, this madman is extracting the bones of his victims. His sheer brutality has the residents of the Big Apple in panic mode. Who is this twisted psycho who's abducted a housewife in broad daylight only to dispose of her lifeless body alongside a lake in Prospect Park, nailed the boneless remains of a nameless drifter to the underside of a boardwalk at Rockaway Beach, allowed the gutted corpse of a single parent to wash ashore under the Brooklyn Bridge, and has had the audacity to leave the desecrated body of the Magnolia Tea heiress rotting atop trash at one of the city's sanitation dumps. NYPD's top cop, Homicide Commander John W. Driscoll, has never witnessed such savagery. Hammered daily by the district attorney, the mayor, and the police commissioner, the lieutenant, who's battling his own inner demons, must use every resource available to put an end to the killings. In a race against time, Driscoll, aided by Sergeant Alagante and Detective Cedric Tomlinson, sets out on a roller coaster of an investigation to first identify the villainous fiend and then put an end to his butchering. Grab Bone Thief by Thomas O'Callaghan now.